So uh, session three, we are talking all development. Um, before we get too far into it, I just want to remind everyone of kind of the basics that we've gone through in both our, our design and general overview sessions. So skateboarding and making sure that we are uh, building things in a very in a very lean way, thinking about how to use what we've built to inform our future decisions. Uh, this extends this theory extends itself to design, development, management, everything that you're going to touch building products. Um, we also talked about the 10x rule, so I just kind of I want to remind you of it so that as we're, we're finally getting the core concepts of management, design, development all together, uh, we're remembering that generally speaking, uh, the design of an idea to get it to production ready will typically take 10x the time of a wireframe. And as a general rule of thumb, it could easily take 10x the amount of time to actually code it. Um, and then that intersection of pixels, code, and money that we talked about that we'll keep kind of getting closer and closer to so that by the end of these sessions, you have a, a clear understanding of how they all work together. Um, and we also have been basing a lot of what we've, we've discussed on this graphic of uh, kind of the x-ray of, of any app um, and how it can go from an idea to production ready design to front end development and uh, what else goes behind that um, <clears throat> in the development stages. So today we're going to focus specifically on the development stage. So front-end development, back-end development, the data layer, uh, and everything in between. Um, so with me this session, and uh, specifically here to answer questions as they come up, uh, someone that is uh, much more suited to answer development questions and has actually spent uh, a good bit of his career teaching development. So Andy is the director of engineering at Stitch Labs. Uh, Stitch Labs has... I think raised over $10 million, works with some of the top brands uh, in distribution. Uh, and outside of this, Andy is also the founder of First Step Coding and the author of Zero to Coder. Um, so any questions that come up today, development specific, you're going to be in good hands. Um, Andy, do you want to add anything to the intro um, before we get into it? I forgot that I'm also a happy Turtle customer. He is a happy Turtle customer and uh, much like Alex who joined us last session, uh, Andy also is a co-founder of Darwin Apps, so we're, uh, we're, we're making the full rounds there. <laughs> All right, um, so let's get into it. So we're going to focus on just this side of, of that graphic that we've been repeating, so it's specifically just the, the three main sections of development. Um, and if you really try to look at everything that could be involved here, it's incredibly overwhelming. Uh, some of the logos that you might see here are, you might recognize iOS and Android, um, some of these are the languages behind iOS and Android, backend languages, uh, design frameworks, Firebase, which is sort of a backend, but not really, Heroku and AWS, different uh, IDEs for actually coding, different types of databases, different ways to store code. Um, there's a lot here, and it can be incredibly overwhelming, and you shouldn't expect to, if you haven't come from a development background, you shouldn't expect to understand all of it at once. Um, it can be very, very simple. Uh, this could be a product. And this is kind of the, the simplest version of, of a developed product that I could think of where we've talked about material UI and, and UI frameworks in the past. Um, Firebase is a system that essentially lets you get by for a little bit without having a backend developer. It's basically a backend as a service. Uh, you're able to put together a user's column and orders, orders table, or sorry, user's table and orders table, those kinds of things, and expose them to an app much in the same way that a backend developer could. So I wanted to bring this example up to show that it doesn't have to be that complicated. Um, and this could cover these entire three layers of front end, back end, and data with material UI being a design framework that we showed before. So basically you're getting pre-built code of a front end. And with Firebase, um, you don't have to be that technical or necessarily a back end developer to get something up and running. Uh, more typically, or, and just to remind you what material UI is, uh, this is a screenshot directly from the page where it shows a table in here. So if you're building something that had just a table, you could quite literally say, I want to use this code as the front end and I want to use Firebase as the back end. And you have a pretty simple setup that, that really is a complete development ecosystem. Um, that said, it, it's more likely to look something like this. So say that we're building an iOS app, uh, it's typically going to have three layers. So the data layer, so you're going to have some kind of database that's actually going to store your information, your users' accounts, even the sensitive information like passwords may be stored, though that gets into uh, a different ballgame of how that's stored. Um, then there's 
a back end. So it's how your data and how your front end are really going to talk to each other, how things are manipulated, how data moves around, how profiles get updated, edited, et cetera, and then what you actually see, touch, feel. Um, there is some overlap between these, but I, I think for the purposes of, of this session, we don't need to get too far into it. But in this example, Swift is a modern language for iOS development. So you would have a front end that's built in Swift. You would have a back end that could be written in Node or Rails or, or something like that. And then you could have a back end uh, database that could be PostgreSQL or MySQL or for an enterprise customer like, or an enterprise build, it might be like Microsoft SQL Server or something like that. Um, but I want you to just start getting familiar with some of these terms and to also mentally think about where, it, where you would position it um, on this kind of graph. Uh, that said, there is more stuff involved. So if you've built a product before, you might have heard of Heroku or AWS or GitHub or GitLab. Um, those are involved even in the simplest setups. So even in this setup, uh, if you have an iOS Swift front end and Node back end and Postgres SQL database, you're probably going to need to host that somewhere. Or you're going to need some kind of system for pulling up a new database, maybe pull up a test database. That's where Heroku really comes in. Heroku, you can think of it as something that makes AWS much easier. Um, that's the simplest way that it's been described to me. Um, and then GitHub is where code is stored. So whether it's Swift code or, or Node code, you're not going to store a database in, in, uh, in, Heroku, in, in GitHub, but either front-end code or back-end code could get stored there. And with GitHub, you can, it's kind of like a track changes for code. Um, and it's GitHub or GitLab or, uh, or a competitor to those is, is almost always used at this stage um, in software projects. So a couple other examples. So we could replace that Material UI front end with Swift. So an iPhone app could have a Firebase backend. Uh, a Firebase backend could actually have a React Native front end. So React Native is essentially a way to build mobile apps with JavaScript. Um, or you could start replacing that backend again with some of the examples like Node or Rails or, uh, or Postgres or uh, MySQL. Um, for a web application, you would simply replace that front end with React instead of React Native or, or iOS. So um, even though I'm using images of an iPhone app, uh, I want you to kind of think about this for web applications, for mobile applications, et cetera, and how these different layers may interchange here. Um, any questions so far? Or Andy, anything to add to clarify uh, anything that I've shown so far? Um, yeah, I think one comment I'd add just on this visual, um, and it's important for everyone to know that the the part of this um, the part of this application that would actually be um, living on your phone, so to speak, would be the front end with React. So this Node JS backend layer, this this um, uh, Postgres database. Important to remember that's actually uh, all that would be um, living on some other server. So your your phone would only be able to get to that data and that backend if you had an internet connection available. So um, that's probably obvious to a lot of you, but just wanted to call that out. Yeah. Thanks for calling that out. Um, all right. So now that we have the, the basis of what the, the, the main development layers are going to look like, um, if you're not a developer yourself, what do you do? How do you work with developers? How do you find developers, et cetera? Um, I wanted to show a similar graphic to, to last time on essentially what are your options? So there's the obvious but potentially painful route of do it yourself and learn to code. Um, and there's an element of this that I think is critical even if you do hire or outsource or anything. I, I do think that um, having the fundamentals of what a system looks like, what engineering looks like, even like even if you don't understand it, just looking at what code even looks like uh, is critical for just speaking the same language and communicating with someone and not to, you know, a, a term that, that I've heard used that I would actually really shy away from is business people that describe themselves as dangerous, meaning that they understand enough about code, but not really enough to, to do it. Um, I would rather just focus your energies on actually understanding some of the fundamentals. You know, don't, don't do it to describe yourself as dangerous, do it to understand what is it that different developers you're working with really are doing. Um, what is a front end developer doing? What is a back end developer doing? What is someone that, that might, describe themselves as a, uh, as a DevOps engineer, you're going to hear a lot of these terms and just ask them, like, what is it that you do? Is it front end? Is it back end? And once you ask that isolating question, um, you can really dig into what is it that, that they do that um, you might need in the future um, or someone like, or to work with someone like them in the future. Uh, all that said, development is not for everyone. I 
I don't write any production level code. I shouldn't be trusted with it. So I'm an example of somebody that does not do any of our own development. Um, uh, but I, I, I do try to stay up to speed with things. I, you know, if it's a hobby project or simply like digging into how something is made, um, I do try to spend some energy there. Um, as you get into to growing your company though, your options are essentially to hire a developer or to outsource. And depending on where you are geographically, uh, hiring, relatively speaking, is still gonna be an expensive option, especially for great developers. But in different parts of the world or different parts of the US, uh, this can be more attainable than what some of Silicon Valley in New York might lead you to believe. In New York and Silicon Valley, you are competing with Amazon and Google and Facebook and, and all those companies. And it's realistic that an engineer might expect 120, 150,000 or more per year, uh, which is, it's a lot of money for a startup. Um, when, when we, like we at this stage at Turtle still don't have anyone at, at those rates. Um, but we do have a bunch of people that are part-time and that's how we make it work for our budgets and, and for our stage of the business. Uh, and with outsourcing, there's, there's a ton of options these days. There's, if, if you really needed to, you could find 15, $20 an hour engineers on Upwork and really vet them carefully and, and make sure that they, they fit the bill for whatever it is that you need to do. Um, you could use something like Turtle where somebody's pre-vetting the engineers for you. You could use something like Gigster where they're kind of putting together an entire team for you and you're paying some of the rates that are closer to, to hiring full timers, but there's a lot of options in the field that if you do your research on whether you, you set it to price or, or to geography or just the type of work setup, um, the, the main thing I would recommend is just don't throw the work over the wall. Uh, I think that's a way to one, pay just as much or more than hiring a full timer. And specifically what I mean by that is you find an agency, they promise you a fixed price, um, it'll be in the hundreds of thousands to build something from zero to fully complete, uh, but you're getting into this really dangerous situation of getting fixed prices on unfixed plans. If, if you're not a, a big company that already has kind of everything figured out and you know, a case for an agency might be, I have an iPhone app and it does everything exactly how I want it to be done and we just need Android engineers to build the Android version and we don't want to think about it. And that's a case where getting a fixed price because there, there's already a very clear North Star of what you're building might make sense. Uh, in most cases though, it doesn't work that way. In most cases, especially with startups, once you get 10% of the way done, you're gonna change your mind for the remaining 90%. So starting that, that relationship off with, this is exactly what we're gonna do and this is exactly what it's gonna cost me and this is exactly who's gonna do it is a really dangerous way to look at it. Um, so uh, to summarize here, I, I, would, I would still recommend learning as much as you can. So and be honest with yourself on what you get, what you don't get, but anybody can learn the fundamentals of, of, of how an app is constructed and a lot of people can go deeper in either front end or back end dev to understand um, what that world looks like. You can hire full timers and eventually you'll want to. So especially for strategic decisions for anything that's high security, um, creating something that, that should be everlasting in your product. So something that you expect to survive five or 10 years, uh, that should be done by co-founders, founding teams, full timers, people that will be around for a long time. Um, but there's a lot of stuff, especially in today's apps that are becoming more and more, I don't wanna say complicated, but there's just a lot more moving parts. Just, just about every product these days is gonna have at least a web application, an iPhone application, an Android application at this stage, maybe a Mac application as well, or a desktop application. So you're talking about five different systems before you really get to competing with, hey, we're on every system so far, which if you look at it as either full-timers or outsourcing, then all of a sudden blending those systems or looking at, at how you can make them work start to make more sense. Um, any questions here? Uh, this is a really important one because I mean, this, this should dictate how you think about budgeting, hiring, um, what developers you work with, what you don't, what you do yourself. Um, so I wanna make sure that if there are any questions, we, uh, we pause here for a bit. All right. Yeah, I have a really quick question. Sure. Do you have any comments on at what point you should decide to switch from outsource or switch from like um, outsourcing the work to hiring a full-time developer? Should you yeah. necessarily do it as soon as you can afford it? Not necessarily as soon as you can afford it, but the affordability is a huge part of it. Um, I, I think that there's this concept of as soon as you get a full-timer, they'll do everything, which is, uh, which is a pipe dream at best. Um, a, a, a high quality engineer, 
or a high quality person in general wants to work on what they enjoy, what they're good at, what feels meaningful to them, which typically isn't everything in the software layer. Uh, some people like front-end development, some people like back-end development, some people really like setting up new systems and getting into DevOps and, and spinning up new servers and, and, and doing that, but it's, it's very unlikely to be one person that can do everything. So I would think of it more as a transition. So at, at first, your finances are going to dictate your business and most startups fail because they run out of money. So if you have $50,000 total, don't hire somebody for 150,000. Like that's just, it would be nonsensical. Um, but uh, as soon as you do have the, the finances for it, having someone that's in there with you in the trenches and, and full time and able to do beyond what's always thought through and dictated and, and clearly laid out and, and to be there to strategize with you becomes incredibly important. So I would think of it as, you know, in my personal opinion, I think blending the two uh, is, uh, is the best approach. And I'm incredibly biased on that because Turtle and the way that we've structured ourselves as a company is very much, very heavy on the part-timer side uh, than full-timer. And a big part of why we exist is building that infrastructure for working with part-timers. Uh, that said, it's not the only way to do it. And I'd actually love to hear Andy's opinion on this because I know that uh, the way that we structure a business is not for everyone. So I want to make sure that you don't think that's the only way to do it. Yeah, I guess um, just to give my two cents on this. Um, I mean, a, a natural time, you might start thinking about should I hire someone? Um, I'd say for one thing, don't, don't, um, uh, I, I wouldn't go the higher route until you, um, until you're, you're contracting out at least 40 hours a week to your contractors. And then you also have kind of more visibility um, into the roadmap and, and know how much runway you have um an obvious benefit of contractors is is you can um have them work on something for a while and then and then pause for a bit whereas with a, a full-timer um uh, they're going to need to be busy all the time um there's also just an added benefit of, of uh, i guess in the trade-offs of like having a full-time person is you do have more um people don't like the contractors can sometimes want to switch contractors, contracts. Um, people don't like to quit jobs that much. Um, so there is a little bit more predictability in terms of like, if you, if you hire someone, you can generally expect that you'll have that same developer uh, available for a long period of time and, and that they'll, they'll have the um, domain knowledge over, over the code for, for, um, and you'll have kind of that internal mastery rather than having to um, train someone up um, whenever you lose someone. Um, so one clear way to think about it is will what they're at the early stages, you have no choice at the early stages, you do what you can afford. Uh, but once it becomes an option, uh, it, it's important to think about it as the longevity of what they're building too. So the longer scale that what they're building might be, the more likely that is to be something that a full timer should do, like architecting a financial backend system that, that should be around for the next five or 10 years versus everybody updates their iPhone apps every three months at this stage. Like an iPhone app front end is a great example for, for outsourcing. Um, that said, you still need to vet quality in the same ways on both sides. And I, I highly recommend treating freelancers and anybody that you work with the same way that you would with full timers. You get in what you put in with, with anyone. Um, and one of the critical mistakes I've, I've seen in, in Darwin apps and, and Turtle as well is people who treat freelancers as second-class citizens uh, or second-class engineers. And while this might feel like, hey, this is somebody I'm paying on an hourly basis and it's easy to do that, it ends up hurting everyone involved. It, it's demotivating for engineers. It just doesn't get everything that you can get out of a person. You know, Just because somebody's not working at 40 hours doesn't mean that they're unqualified or unskilled or unmotivated to do this with you. All right, um, and kind of transitioning on that question on, on full-time or hourly, there's a, there's a really simple 2x rule to think about as you're budgeting. So th this math doesn't work out perfectly, but as you think about what somebody costs per hour or per year, you can essentially just double the hourly rate and that gets you about their annual salary. So 25 bucks an hour ends up being about 50,000 a year if you're looking at a 40 hour week. $50 an hour ends up being about 100K a year and 100 an hour ends up being about 200K a year. So as you're thinking about, hey, this person's working 
10 hours a week or 15 hours a week or 20 hours a week and as they start getting up to 40 this is important for thinking from a budgetary standpoint about that transition um, and just to do a quick little math proof there so 50 bucks per hour 52 weeks in a year 40 hours per week ends up being 50 times about 2000 so ends up being 104. so yeah we're within a five percent margin of error there all right so uh when working with developers uh you know, it's critical to to align a north star that's clear and, and motivating and uh something that can't get misinterpreted we talked about this a lot in the design session, uh, but it becomes uh, even more important as you actually hand things off to dev and as you're, you know, not to scare everyone, but as you start spending 10x more than what you would have spent on design. Um, this is a design that we went through last time where we talked about the structure of start with a context, uh, describe the action, and then show the outcome. I think this framework actually works really well for, for developers as well. I mean, this wouldn't be literally what you send someone. You, you'll need to send the actual design files and make sure that uh, everything is, is clear for, uh, for people and they can actually pick apart the little elements and their size and their colors and all that. But it's still just as important for a developer to see, okay, what is my starting point here? Just even something as simple as this is an iPhone app or this is an Android app or it, everything before the screen is already built. So give a developer that context describe that action or use case and show that outcome. And I, I would say this outcome for, for the purposes of the developer is probably the most important part of all this. Um, they're all important, but that, that outcome does become a, North, a dev ready North Star. Of, this is what, I, what we need to get to in some way, shape or form by the time that we're done building this. Uh, in, in a developer's view, you're probably gonna be handing off design files. So I, uh, I, I was emailing with one of you where you were asking about Figma versus Zeppelin, et cetera. So I took a quick screenshot of, of what something looks like in Figma when it's being shared. Uh, the nice thing about Figma is you can share a link and uh, a design file can give you, this might not be the verbatim code that a the developer will take, but the fact that it can give you something like this means that there's enough information in there for a developer to know, here's the size of something, here are the colors of something, Here's the positioning of something, the margin, the padding, et cetera. Um, so they don't have to go and download the design tool and inspect this stuff, et cetera. So either Figma or uh, Sketch used with Zeppelin or there's tools like AvoCode today. There's a lot of different ones that, that function this way. They're not very different. They're not very hard to, to pick up, at least that, that final handoff piece. Uh, but it's important to kind of see, okay, if you've designed something, like sometimes people hand things off in a PDF. So in that PDF, uh, you know, a developer has to pick up like what are the sizes here and what are the original design files that's kind of the worst of it an unorganized design file is sort of in between and an organized design file where somebody can really see the elements behind something uh end up being the best way to, to hand things off um so you might want to also give you know context as to to what is something currently what are the new designs uh what is the the technical infrastructure behind something. So I, I pulled a screenshot that we have from some of our help docs where uh, this is an in, inside of a turtle chat. And you might, if, if we're, re this was quite literally us rebuilding our notifications panel. So I used a, a very real example of showing somebody what something looked like before, updated designs, and then I faked this part, but here's the current repo, which would mean like a link to, to GitHub. There's a readme in there. Um, and the notifications code should be easy to find. And you know, as you're working with people, it's not like there's this cold and hard cutoff of, of documentation. Like they, they will ask you uh, in, in the healthiest teams, it's very conversational. So if a developer doesn't have what they need, they will ask you for it. Uh, so don't assume that this will be everything they need, but um, you should try to give as much context as possible, not only in the actual design, but the starting points, uh, where they can find what they need, et cetera, and, uh, and still be prepared for questions to come up. Uh, and something when, when I started asking Venkat and, and the other engineers that'll be joining us in a few minutes, uh, you know, what is important to you in specifications? One of the things that came up most commonly was not just the design, but the, the why, um, why are you building something? Why does it need to exist? You know, we, we might get stuck into the technicalities of specs and, and all, but, uh, a lot of you come with skills that are very different from design or, or development and being able to communicate the not only like the passion behind something, the, the customer, the, the end goal of, of what you want a customer to be able to accomplish in here it becomes incredibly important for somebody sitting there in the weeds of work and why they're actually doing it. I, I want to 
emphasize this as much as I possibly can, because uh, this has come up so many times with Turtle. I mean, the, the things that we've built that end up being our strongest features are the ones that we can all rally behind and everybody understands exactly why they need to exist. It's not just this like siloed box of, of here requirements and please get it done in this amount of time. Uh, treating someone as you know a partner that you're working with to accomplish a goal and having everyone very clearly understand why it's being built uh, typically uh, achieves the best results. So uh, an example of that is that same design that we just talked about, but describing why we've been building this. So users having tr trouble distinguishing read and unread messages. So in working on this, the new design is supposed to help you distinguish that more, but as a developer's working on this, they can also keep that in the back of their minds where, hey, this we built this to design, but it's still pretty hard to distinguish read and unread messages. So they can get aligned with the same goal and you're, you're on the same team and, and working towards that same North Star, even if that's different than what the specific designs might show. Uh, then uh, outside of designs and, and specs and handoff, I, uh, I wanna talk about budget and time a bit. So I would consider designs as scope. So describing things either visually or, or through task items, et cetera. But there's these other elements of budget and time that a non-developer can absolutely be in control of. So, uh, how I would approach this is to think about a, a project or something that you're working on. Like if you're building an app for the first time, even if you don't know how to code, you, you still know your budget and you still know your general goals. So without having any context into what you're building, if you know that you have a $5,000 budget or $10,000 budget and you have something that you need to launch by, you know, January 1st, those are constraints that help mold. What is it that the scope is going to look like? And, I want to point out this flex scope piece because it, it becomes critical for, for how you operate and motivate a team and, and how you communicate with each other. The fixed budget is, let's say that we have a $10,000 budget. Fixed timeline is we need to get something done by January 1st. Those end up motivating this scope because it becomes a conversation of, well, if we have X amount of dollars possible, that becomes Y amount of hours. That, that's a pretty simple calculation. Everyone can start communicating around, okay, well, this isn't actually going to be possible. So let's, as a team, understand what our priorities of that scope, what we can get done, what we can't get done. Um, and it forces everyone to really, you know, going back to some of those skateboarding fundamentals that we talked about in the first couple of sessions, forces everyone to really think about, well, if we can't get everything done, what is the most important to get done here? Uh, and even in the context of, you know, this notification panel to 20 hours might sound like a lot for something like this, but if you really get into every kind of screen size, every, every single browser, um, every possible interaction that you might take when hovering over an item or clicking over an item, this could easily go beyond 20 hours. But communicating that this has a 20 hour budget and we need this done within the next two weeks forces whoever you're working with to think about, okay, well, how can we accomplish this goal within 20 hours and two weeks? It's these, it's these potentially artificial constraints that become very non-artificial very quickly as you start thinking about the, the lifeline of a company, which is very budget related and, and finance driven not just code driven. Um, I wanted to include some resources before we start transitioning to uh, uh, Venkat and three of our Turtle developers joining us. So I, I put in Andy's book, which I think is fantastic. I actually took Andy's course uh, myself and I, I thought it was incredibly refreshing and helpful. Uh, and, and I picked up a lot of fundamentals that I just never had because I never had any formal computer science training. I have a mechanical engineering degree, not a CS degree. Uh, I put in some feature list examples from, from our help docs that I think could be useful for you to start thinking about what do your feature list examples look like and, and your specs look like. Um, ready specs and then an article that uh, goes much deeper into uh, that fixed budget, fixed timeline, flex scope approach called fixed skateboard management. So it will be in the PDFs that we share. Um, so without further ado, we're going to welcome our, our guests. Uh, let me make see who's here. Looks like we've got Venkat, Andre, Camaro, uh, and oh, we got everyone. All right, awesome. So uh, here's who's joining us today. We've got Vitor from Brazil. He's an iOS developer where he focuses specifically on, on the Apple ecosystem and is borderline obsessed with the, the Apple ecosystem, but uh, he has development experience in React as well. We have Andre from Colombia, who's uh, a web developer, a full stack web developer that focuses on React and on Node. Uh, we have Roman from Russia. Uh, who is also a full stack dev that's front end leading, so focuses more on React, React Native. Um, and then we have Vankat, my co-founder and Turtle CTO, uh, who 
focuses more on backend development and he's got some languages here that these two you probably never even heard of, but Elixir, uh, backend develop backend language that is a lot of, it's, it's our backend language for Turtle. Uh, Flutter, which is similar to React Native, sort of. We can get into that at another time. And Ruby on Rails, which is a backend language that would be kind of synonymous with Node, uh, just a different version of that. So um, guys, welcome and thank you for being here. So hey, I, uh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I want to make sure that the majority of the time can be spent with you asking developers real questions. Um, they can be specific to your projects. They, they can be general. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to play this, uh, it's almost going to be like a Jeopardy game, but with estimates so that you can start getting a sense from, from a developer's perspective, uh, what may something take? What may something take to build? So on an iPad here, I've actually got direct messages set up with Uncat, Vitor, Andre, and Andy, if you've got Turtle open, I've actually got a message set up for you as well, um, if you don't mind opening it up on web. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a design on like a basic description and I'm going to give you three options for what you might think this would take from an hour's perspective. So I'd, please don't spend more than like 20 seconds thinking about it because it shouldn't be an exact dissection. I just want people to get an idea of, of what these things may take in order to back to. Uh, so we're going to play how many hours would this take? And before we do this, I want to preface from, uh, from our first session, you don't want to ask developers how much will this app cost. Uh, you don't want to ask your team how much will this app cost because if you're building something new, nobody knows. You can get to the next milestone, but getting to this, there is no complete if your product is your company. Facebook spends more on their, their products every single day as they grow and get bigger. Uh, there is no finite cost to it. So how much will this app cost is the wrong way to think about it, but as you're adding features or building specifics to it, you absolutely can take requirements and at least get a sense of, is this gonna be 10, 100, or 1,000 hours? And you should have that information so that you can start nurturing and think about prioritization, complexity, et cetera. So uh, for a first one, we have this design. I'm going to describe the product and give you some assumptions. Then I'm going to ask you to each chat me uh, your answer to this. So we're going to have a, uh, an iPhone only React Native or Swift application that is essentially an Instagram for sharing coins. So we're going to be able to see a quick intro, log in with Facebook, uh, take a picture of the front and back of a coin, share it to just my library. I don't need to see other people's libraries. And then I can also share it to Facebook. Uh, designs will be provided to you via Figma. We're going to use Firebase as a backend. Um, and then I plan to use this as a prototype with up to 20 friends, but this won't be like a wider public release. So uh, 10, 100, or 1,000 hours. What goes first? Uh, if you could just okay. chat uh, your answer first, um, and then once we get those, those answers, I'll, uh, I'll ask you guys to, to maybe dive a little deeper to them, especially if we have discrepancies. Yeah, so, so uh, on, on Slack, right? Uh, no, 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 on, on Turtle. So I have, a, I have a message open here. I'll just send you a quick. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, I had to. Is it? So, Vankat, thank you for your answer. Roman, thank you for your answer. Andy, thank you for your answer. Uh, Andre and Vitor, if you don't mind just shooting me a, a quick message on Twitter what you think. Okay, we got four out of five. So it's between these three options. Yeah, just only only choose between these three options. Or I, I am sending. Sorry, God. No worries. Something my message is not going forward. So I don't know. You want to just slack? You want to just slack me? Oh, I got it. Just I, I see it. It's that. Okay, uh, so we actually got the same exact answer from everyone. Uh, so, this worked, by, we, <laughs> so this worked out. Oh, okay, so. Andre, I got your message. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we got the same exact answer from everyone. So everyone said 100 hours in this case. Um, and before we go into the details of that, does that surprise anyone uh, in the audience? Because um, I want to make sure that we can dig into to that and why. All right, if not, um, Vitor, do you want to maybe talk a little about how you thought about getting to that 100 hours just so that we can uh, help, uh, help the audience? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so uh, as, you, as you mentioned, I'm uh, focused on the iOS development and uh, using Swift. So uh, one of the things that I, I, I face with um, uh, designs, early stage designs is that 
uh, they tend to go into more generic uh, aesthetics, uh, possibly because the app may be also uh, developed on Android or, or they might have a, a web um, a web feeding already. So, and this is something that usually is not taken into account. Like, uh, if you want to develop your own uh, UI kit, your 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 UI elements, that that uh, by itself is a feature which sometimes people don't understand. So, uh, what what came to my mind here is that I split this into two three steps. The first one is actually building the skeleton, like everything ugly, but everything working. The second one is to actually develop the UI uh, and then make sure everything works with the backend, because as, uh, as we have on the assumptions, uh, we will use Fire, Firebase as backend. So we are going to persist that information locally and on a, on a server. So uh, that's, that's my, my logic behind the 100 hours. Uh, is, is that okay, yeah. go into more details? But no, 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 that, that's perfect. Um, and, and just to uh, highlight, you know, this framing becomes very important because if I didn't include this, I, I doubt that we would have all gotten the same answer from, from all five. That's um, true. So it, I just want to reiterate to everyone in the audience, when, when, you're, uh, when you're communicating specifications, the more constraints that you can put around it, everything from what platform is it on, what's the back end going to look like, how will designs be delivered? Um, how do you plan to use the product? If this said 200 people, this could have been a little different, or maybe not 200, but at the moment it says 2,000 people, then it becomes a much more complex application that needs to you know, cover every edge case, cover every kind of device type, et cetera. So, all right, uh, let's do another one. So in this case, we're gonna use this material UI table. I'm gonna provide a CSV file of 200 profiles to be sorted and listed. That is gonna be name, hours, worked, rate, and a GitHub URL. This will only be used internally, so the looks don't matter. And I would need to share a URL with the internal team, so that this would need to get hosted somewhere, but I don't really care where it's hosted. And we can just verbatim use this material UI table. I, I don't need it to look any different than this. Um, no styling necessary, just this material UI table. Um, so for this one, if you could please chat me again uh, once you're ready. Claude, where would the data be coming from in this example? So I would just provide a CSV file. Of oh, okay. Um, okay. It looks like I've got answers from everyone. Andre, is your is your messenger still uh, slowing down a little bit? All right, uh, so it looks like everyone an answered with 10. Or Roman followed up with 450 if there are more details. Sorry, yes, the, the message shows up in gray and it doesn't go through. Okay, um, Andre, if, you're, if your connection's lagging a little bit, do you wanna just, do you wanna just say your answer so that we know? What, what would you say between 10, 50, and 100 here? Sorry, it's 10. Uh, it's cool. not going forward in the turtle, but I sent you through Slack. Cool. But yeah, it's yeah. 10. Awesome. So we got the same answer from everyone, at least the starting answer of 10 hours. Um, in this case, uh, Vankat, do you want to maybe talk us through how you came to 10 hours? Yeah. So usually when I when I come up with an estimate, I kind of try to use a, bait, a benchmark of like something I've built in the past that might be of similar complexity. And like, I've, I don't remember specifically, and I've definitely had moments where I like would spend like five hours, like putting together a, a quick, quick demo like this. So, um, yeah. so 10 is like, and a lot of times I'll also double it as well. So that would bring us to, to 10, just, yeah. just the for unknowns. But, it, but in general, this like, take this specific UI component and implement it pretty simply without any design changes is a, is a pretty quick operation. Yeah, and another thing is that you're using, like this is, you're, you're linking the material UI, uh, which would mean that there's no real design that I need to do. I can just use like off the shelf components instead of wasting time on design. <laughs> and as, as intimidating as these may look uh, initially, I would urge even, even if you don't have the development experience, like click around these components and find stuff that looks like it'll fit 
your product because just the fact that I've linked to a specific UI component versus saying we can use a UI component means I've already done that, that strategic guesswork for, for a developer instead of them having to then go and research different UI components, ask you what you think is good, et cetera, which becomes another level of back and forth instead of just a clear North Star. Um, all right, last one. So we're building a new music player application uh, with real-time messaging between users. This needs to work on iOS, Android, and web. Uh, the app will need a custom backend, so we can't use Firebase. Uh, we'll provide all designs. Uh, people need to be able to pay for subscriptions inside of there. That's going to be our monetization model. And we're targeting about 500 first users. Um, so imagine in this case, you would get Figma designs of everything that lays out. Uh, I'd assume it's about 80 total screens uh, with every iteration of profile and, and opening up uh, a song, et cetera. Um, you don't have to worry about the actual licensing and, and hosting of the music. We'll figure that internally. Uh, but we do need a custom backend to be able to uh, actually store those files and, and uh, play them for the subscribe. So in this case, um, 2,200 or 2,000 hours. Okay, once again, uh, this is, I couldn't have planned, Every, everybody came with the same answer again with almost everyone iterating that it'd actually be even more than, than the highest option here. So everyone answered 2,000 hours and a couple people. So Roman said, uh, I'd say we need to split this to MVP versions for a more precise estimate, but he also started it with 2,000 plus. And Andy said, uh, more than 2,000. And if it was an option, I would have actually chosen 10,000 hours. So. The, uh, Andy, do you want to maybe talk about that a bit with, you know, what, what might go into 10,000 hours for something like this? Um, yeah. Uh, so live streaming is, uh, one component that's just known to be a challenge, uh, and a, a music app in particular is really sensitive to, um, any problems with streaming and, you know, going, going, for example, if you're listening on a train and you're uh, going offline. Actually, I left out the targeting about 500 first users. So, so I probably wouldn't say that high of an estimate. I was thinking kind of uh, a bigger. And you even think you're like, the production that. release, like get this out to as many people as will sign up. Yeah. Got it. Um, but yeah, still, still on standby. I, I think it, over 2000, just because uh, also you said 60 screens. Um, that's that's quite a large number of screens and having a custom API, there'd be a lot involved with that as right. well. It's and then maybe maybe the fact that it's on on all three platforms too, so iOS, Android, and web. Like Definitely. Any, yeah. any time that somebody says iOS, Android, web, and a custom backend will probably get you into the thousands of hours once all is said and done in, in a real production app. Um, Roman, I want to dig into, you know, you said, You'd split it into MVP versions for a more precise estimate. Uh, how would you work with someone? Um, how would you work with a founder in doing something like that? Uh, well, basically, the task is a really a huge one, and uh, there are lots of features, lots of uh, different platforms, which can uh, uh, generally make the uh, customer look to uh, 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 to on. Uh, uh, too unreliable uh, uh, about the, his, his own estimates, the, the team estimates, and uh, there are just too many things uh, to think of uh, at once, uh, and this can be re really puzzling uh, for everyone. So yeah. it's it's really better to split the split your uh, application or your ideas uh, into more uh, smaller chunks and work with them, implement them. Uh, step by step and if it's uh, let's say if it's a music player application but better start with the, the real music uh, feature where people just can listen to music then add some messaging then add some like uh, web support and yada yada so then and, if, uh, if, yeah. if, a, if a founder came to you with um, these specifications but said hey what can we get if we only built it for one platform and we had a budget of 200 hours over the next six months do you think that you, that you could work with them to, to build a you know, ios only or android only 
uh, version that's at least clickable. We might have to reduce scope and, and flex that scope, but could you at least get an app that's in common hands within that time? Uh, uh, no, not, not really sure about the 200 hours, but uh, basically it's, it's, uh, it's much easier to work uh, uh, on, a, on a smaller scale uh, uh, from, from the start because uh, you can uh, uh, release the product uh, much faster and uh, the customer will always uh, have uh, a better understanding and a faster understanding that's uh, about the project and how it works and how he feels about it uh, and probably uh, whether he needs or, do, or, or doesn't need to change anything. And it's really uh, much uh, easier for everyone. Got it. Well, thank yeah. you. Um, Rankata, is there something you wanted to add? Yeah, to add, to add to what he said, like, um, I would take, so I would take, I would like identify like the, the kind of like the end point of the app. So in this case, it's playing a song and I would take the shortest path I can get to playing a song. Um, and the reason, and iterate from there with the customer. The reason for that is like, even before, like before I was, you know, we were working on Turtle and I was in, in the freelance world, I worked with a lot of startups and every time you'd have something of this scope, nine out of 10 times, like users end up not caring about most of the stuff they, they think that the customer thinks they care about uh, um, initially. So like, even if, like, even if this will take you like that amount of time, like most of the time, like you're, you're, you're just kind of shooting in the dark about like what your users actually want. So what, what would happen is like, they would spend all this time spending months building out this application um, to find out that users don't care about most of the features throw those features out and then start iterating from there. So it was just a complete waste of, of money. And I mean, a, so, very, a very real example of that is uh, in Turtles products, we have a lot of different features, everything from budgeting to payments to estimates, et cetera, to task management. And the most used feature in asynchronous work is chat. When you're not sitting in a room with someone, you're chatting with them. So more recently, the majority of our engineering efforts have gone to making chat reliable and fast and to work offline, et cetera. So for the last uh, several months, like 90% of our engineering hours for, um, have been going only to chat and nothing else. Yeah, and if you had asked us when we were getting started, what would the most important feature be? We would not have told you chat. Yeah. So uh, uh, there are actually uh, lots of interesting stuff written in like a minor, not a brochure, but a minor small book called Lean Startup. Yeah, uh, there are lots, lots of things about MVPs like uh, estimates, and yeah, that that's uh, a really good thing to uh, to know for sure what you want from your product uh, and uh, how to split it uh, into my into multiple chunks. Roman, do you mean uh, Eric Ries's book, The Lean Startup? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, I read it like uh, three or four years ago. It was a really small one, but uh, was really reach on uh, different features for startups and for MVPs. And it was really uh, a good thing to start with when thinking about creating uh, some applications from scratch. That's great. Um, all right, so we have uh, about 10 minutes. Uh, and I wanna make sure that, that the founders and the audience can all um, answer anything that's been on their minds either through the session or if there's anything specific that um, you wanna ask, I'm gonna pull up uh, back to this screen, just so you can get a sense of where everyone is and what they covered. Andy, I'm sorry, I should have made you one of these as well. Um, a little profile view. Uh, but Andy uh, is, a, is a full stack engineer that, that's more focused on, on man he's a director of engineering at Stitch Labs now, so he's more, ma more focused on the management of engineers, the budgeting behind it, and kind of motivating a team and, and managing a team um, than, than doing the development itself. Um, but he'll still be able to answer uh, pretty in the weed questions here as well. Um, is there uh, is there anyone that wants to kick off any questions? I've got a few planned here that I can that I can ask, but I'd I'd much rather. Uh, uh, one sec, we got one in chat. Nick, uh, do you want to kick it off? Thanks, Bob. Um Thank you, uh, Andy and Vitor and Andre and Roman and Ben Cat. Um, so. Well, I mentioned this a little bit at the beginning, um, just talking about, um, you know, what specifically gets you excited about working on a project. And I, I'd love to know, you know, just in terms of working with folks 
uh, who you've never worked with, like just what gets you particularly motivated about getting going on something new? If there's one, you know, maybe one, one, one thing in particular. Um, yeah, well, well, in general, uh, uh, there are lots of things that uh, that motivates uh, the programmers and the devs, uh, uh, and it's uh, the actual work being done and the actual product working on, uh, in, uh, eventually, and uh, that's really a blast, and uh, it keeps you uh, you in pace, and uh, it's always uh, uh, it's always great to see that uh, your work uh, uh, results uh, in something actually working, helping people. Uh, and it makes them enjoy the product and uh, it's really uh, uh, it's really the most fun thing in uh, development so uh, so yeah basically it's uh, not some particular thing but the whole development process in general and uh, its results Any, anyone else would like, add? Yeah. yeah on my side um, on my side I usually get uh, very excited when projects do uh, put me closer to uh, what the users are actually going to uh, get. So I am uh, I have more more excitement on working on front end projects and uh, building custom uh, user experiences than working on a more uh, mathematical situations or, or servers. So that's a, a huge plus for me when there's a new project where you're going to develop something that is going to be uh, directly handed by a user and you can, can make that experience as best as possible. Yeah, um, I, would say, I would say for me, and I could speak for some friends of mine as well that are developers, uh, like customer validation like, is, a, is a big one. Um, like developers, it's 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 pretty demotivating to be working on an app and see it being not being used. Um, so just even something as simple as like uh, we've talked to these users or we've already solved a problem for them, we know that it's a real problem uh, can go a long way. And and once like it's in use, uh, going to the customers, like getting their feelings on how the app is, like showing that those use cases actually live uh, back to the engineer can actually. I think that's also uh, motivating for me as well. And I, I, I think I might be speaking for others too. Yeah. And I want to highlight something in, across those three answers. Um, none of that had to do with anything engineering related. So just, just to reiterate, like you don't need to be a developer yourself to know what motivates developers. Like every, every answer was around being able to touch and feel the actual product, being able to go to the customer for feedback, getting validation from the customer, um, scoping the product to something that that's actually usable. Uh, none of that was, you know, I want it to be on iOS with the, with the specific library or anything like that. Um, uh, we can go deeper into that one if we wanted to, but I want to make sure if there's any other questions, we get a chance. All right. Oh, uh, if not, I'm going to uh, go to my prep questions here. So. Um, as what is the uh, worst experience that you've had? If, if each of you could give us a quick little story of uh, a nightmare customer, because one of the best ways to, to think about what to do is knowing what not to do. So, um, if, if you're able to speak it, and please, you know, don't say anyone specifically, but uh, give us. Can I go first? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for me, uh, the worst experience is when. Um, the owner and then the customer, they, uh, of course, they know what they need, but they not, they not necessarily know the best way to get there. And, uh, of course, this is a, this is a game where we, we try to, to get into the best possible situation, but sometimes, uh, they, they need to listen to, to what we have to say in a more technical matter. So, Sometimes just small details uh, lead into huge paths that like might have cost uh, hours, hundreds of, of hours sometimes just because uh, something wasn't uh, planned correctly or, or even not considered at the beginning. So I would say that uh, you know what you need and we know how to do it. So we should, we should 
uh, match our, our skills in, into a single a single goal. So that's one bad experience I had. Was the bat were basically was your pushback or or when you tried to get more info was it kind of ignored and, and they were just like we're building no this. no in, no in any way but uh, uh, sometimes like uh, I, I'm saying this more specifically related to Apple and the Apple ecosystem is a bit more um, uh, rigid in, if you compare it to Android or or even web so sometimes you have some constraints that it's not a it's not a thing on on uh, Android development for some libraries and stuff like this, or even the designs, uh, like they, 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 um, they get a, a, a pretty uh, material design UI and they, they assume that you are getting the same, uh, the same elements that you have on Android, but it's completely different, the, the feel, the look, how they interact. So a, 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 a dumb decision of just creating those elements could cost you like one or two weeks just to get those buttons working the way you, you imagine. And you could have avoided this by just using simple uh, U, um, iOS kit uh, default elements, uh, at least on the first MVPs. So th those are situations in, in that they, they have no idea. They, they, don't need, they don't need to know this, but we, we are here to provide that feedback. Yeah, so ask a lot of questions and there's, you know, don't assume that your designs are gonna just be what's built. Uh, get feedback on those designs, especially in the early stages. Yeah. You could save yourself. Basically, a lot. just just communicate. <laughs> that's the that's the thing. Yeah, and to uh, to summarize, I think a lot of what Vitor is saying, it's it's the 10x rule at work. You know, there was an idea that didn't take much to come up with. Um, it got designed and it became part of the scope. And then before you know it, it took 10x the time to to build, and it was the wrong thing. Uh, yeah, from my side, uh, like the the two worst nightmares I had uh, in my life. Uh, one is like a very simple example of uh, a customer that doesn't know what he wants and it turns out uh, that uh, he wants uh, like uh, one set of features but uh, when you uh, came to an agreement, uh, planned your work, planned your like uh, short to meet uh, uh, to meet term, uh, when you planned short to meet term for the project, it turns out there are, uh, there are much more behind it, uh, there are much more stuff to do and uh, it shifts your schedule uh, and uh, it completely uh, uh, breaks your uh, feeling about the customer and about uh, the project because uh, uh, when someone uh, yeah has a has a decent plan, it's it's always much better for all of the parts of the uh, of the project uh, because it really makes you feel uh, more like. Uh, both restricted and more happy about how things are going and you, you definitely know when uh, when it will end or when it will come to uh somewhat of a uh finished or like a better project uh and uh, uh another uh, good example is uh when uh, you, you when, when you have a chance to work uh on uh, a legacy project or a project that was developed uh, uh, before you were invited to the project, and it's, it's sometimes it happens that uh, uh, at the very first uh, step of the uh, startup or any application, uh, some customers tend to think that uh, it's good to pay like uh, uh, a smaller buck for for a junior developer, and then when uh, when you get the MVP uh, and you uh, get more finances, uh, invite much more experienced developers and when you uh, join such a project, you uh, you 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 start to realize that uh, uh, most of uh, the project code is uh, uh, barely usable, barely uh, enhanceable, and uh, it's really a, it's really an upset when you work in a project that was uh, initially uh, poorly coded and poorly designed uh, in terms of uh, both architecture and uh, the code itself. Uh, and uh, it, it's really uh, a big and really big trade-off when uh, one wants to uh, save some budget uh, on the very first steps uh, of his project. Yeah, thanks. Cool. I think that comes up a lot uh, and it's a pretty difficult situation because if you've already invested in a product and you want to be able to use the code behind a product, um, it's very unnatural to just say, let's rebuild it from scratch. And you shouldn't just say that, like that shouldn't be the blind assumption either. But it becomes a very difficult consideration of, 
well, what's the motivation factor behind this? And how much does that motivation potentially impact your actual speed and spend at the end? Um, it all starts working together once you kind of dig the layers deep enough. And while it's very rare that a developer wants to kind of pick up someone else's code, it's, all, it's always more fun to start from scratch and think about things in your own way. Um, there's, there's absolutely a balance that has to happen of how much do we reuse? If we do, how much do we refactor it? Um, and especially the situations that Roman's talking about where in the earlier stages when budgets are smaller, you're more likely to not, not because you want to, but because of budgets, you know, you're optimizing for price and you might have a lower scale developer working on something. Uh, but keep in mind that you know, a, a skateboard is to get you the information necessary for the next steps, not necessarily to be your like bricks that will stay there for the long life of your company. Um, and don't be afraid to let go of that. And you know, in the short term, it almost always feels like it's better to just not rebuild uh, or not recode and to use whatever we have. But once you start stretching out the two years or five years of your company or the velocity behind uh, each team member and their motivation and their clarity and how likely they are to churn, meaning how likely they are to jump off your project if they're too demotivated and working on it, um, all of those factors start, start becoming a massive consideration here. Um, so guys, I, uh, we're, we're right past 10 o'clock here. Andy had to jump off and he just sent us a message. Uh, if, uh, if anyone has any specific questions, I can hang on for a bit uh, after, but I wanna make sure that we can uh, let our, our guests go on with the rest of their day. Um, so, guys, thank you so much for joining us. So Andy, Andre, Romero, Vitor, Venkat, we really appreciate uh, everyone joining and answering questions and kind of playing that that estimates game with us. Uh, I think it's uh, a unique and, and very helpful experience for, for founders that may not have had a chance to talk to so many developers uh, at the same time. Um, thank you for being here. And uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Of course. Yeah, thank you. Really thank you appreciate Yeah. Cheers. Uh, so next session will be next Thursday. Um, so uh, I, I, I do think that you have enough information now where you should start thinking about um, what are the budgets behind your projects? What, what are those basic designs gonna start looking like? What is your skateboard? Whether that's a text-based skateboard, a design-based skateboard, uh, if you actually are starting to get production level ready designs together, you are starting to pick up the fundamentals of what all that looks like. Uh, the two sessions that we have remaining are management and budgeting. So budgeting is gonna go into uh, a little deeper on, on that 2X rule, we're gonna pull up some spreadsheets and actually calculate out what, what certain projects might look like. We're gonna look at some historical data on turtle projects and, and what hours behind those look like. So we'll go deeper there and, and get some practice and equating dollars to hours to code and, and what that looks like. On the management side, we're gonna go deeper into uh, different kinds of uh, play, different places that you may be able to find developers, uh, best ways to work with them, the project management systems used, weekly planning, monthly planning, et cetera. Uh, and then in the last session, we're gonna put it all together and, and leave you with, with uh, hopefully enough information to uh, feel good about putting together a flex scope, fixed budget, fixed timeline uh, feature list. And, and uh, we will uh, then transition into that last week of competition for, for 5K in credit. Uh, the way in which, you know, you heard some of the reactions from developers today and on what, uh, what is complex, what isn't, what, what might take eight hours, what, take 2,000 plus hours. So those same developers, not, not you guys specifically, though I'm gonna invite you to vote as well, are gonna actually vote on that feature list. So I won't be the one deciding uh, the winner of that credit. It will be developers deciding. So the motivation factor becomes a critical piece of this. So how clear are you making it for someone? Um, how, how much are you thinking about the work that they'll be doing? And uh, motivation will become a, a, a key player in this. I, th I think that came up a lot today with you know, it's not someone, it's not starting code, it's not picking up a specific feature that's not really gonna be used that's in the weeds somewhere. It's something important that will be used, that, that's thought through, that's complete, um, that's concise, and, and that has some, you've heard the, the term constraints come up from Romero and for myself a few times. Um, so giving those constraints, it might sound like you're taking away someone's freedom, but at the same time, you're, you're giving them a framework to think about uh, what is it that they're building, because the more open-ended that, that it is, the less likely it is that what's in your head and what's in their head is gonna be the same thing. So uh, thank you all for, for your time today. Um, Wait, uh, Vlad, before we sign off, let me just ask a clarifying question for the group. 
uh, by next week, should people competing for the grant have a design ready or just a, just a wireframe or, you know, what are you I expecting would, to see? I would encourage at least a wireframe so that we can start giving you feedback on them and that so you're feeling confident of, you know, spending the next couple weeks after that uh, refining it to get it to a point that uh, we can present that to developers for uh, looking at and voting on, on who will be the winner there. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't and, and if you're not feeling comfortable with it, you know, reach out to Brianna or myself so that we can uh, make sure to, to work with you through it. Uh, but if you are feeling comfortable with the wireframe things or using existing UI frameworks to kind of piece together a product, um, I would encourage you to get as far as you can already because the further you can get, the more we can uh, give you feedback and iterate with it and the more time we have to do that over the next few weeks. Awesome. Thanks so much. Of course. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and especially thank you for, uh, for our guests for joining us. So thanks so much. Everyone has a great, uh, great Friday and great weekend ahead. Thank you all. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.